Good morning, everybody. Uh, we welcome you to this webinar, Analyzing Future Demand, Supply and Transport of Hydrogen. We're very keen and thrilled to have with us today Katri Simpson, the Energy Commissioner of the EU Commission. Uh, and uh, she's here, which also is a clear reflection of the importance of this topic in the light of the Green Deal and energy transformation that we're looking and trying to achieve. Um, what we have presented and prepared for you today, if you please go to the next slides. Uh, is a short welcome introduction, giving setting the stage. Um, then I will hand over the word uh, to Ms. Simpson for her reflections on the topic, which will then be followed by a more detailed presentation of our study by Guidehouse, uh, which was followed by questions and answers. So let me start maybe by introducing who we actually are, and I would like for that to take the next slide. My name is Daniel Mutmann. I am the coordinator of the European Hydrogen in, uh, Backbone Initiative, and uh, in my home turf, I am working for OGE, Germany's largest gas TSO, where I'm responsible for corporate development, policy, and communication. You see here a map with 23 logos. 23 uh, gas TSOs uh, that come together to work together on one particular subject. And let me give you a little bit of history, how that came about. In the beginning of last year, the hydrogen topic was taking quite some dynamic uh, development. And unlike with many, with some other energy sources or carriers, in hydrogen, we have one challenge, and that is that we have to develop everything simultaneously. The supply side, the demand side, the transportation and trading that comes with it. So it reminds me a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle. Many pieces that need to be put in place so that you see the full picture. Uh, when we as gas TSOs talk to our customers and people that are connected to our grid, uh, we determined and found out that, of course, it's very important to see that full picture. Because if you want, as an industry, convert your processes to hydrogen, you want to make sure that hydrogen is actually available. You want to be uh, know that it's competitively priced and uh, that there is secure supply around. Uh, likewise, we all have discussions. I mean, energy is and will always be a very political topic because it's the underlying fundament of economic development. So we have having discussions with policymakers, and there as well, we need to see a clearer view of the full picture. That was the starting point when we said, as gas TSOs today, we are transporting predominantly fossil fuel. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the contribution and the role, and what do we bring to the table for the future energy system? And we do have quite some things to bring to the table, namely, we have a Europe-wide infrastructure in place that can be put to use for hydrogen. That was the starting point. So we wanted to show and do those jigsaw puzzle pieces onto the full picture uh, that we actually oversee, where we have the competency, and that is how can this logistical question be addressed, what is possible, and what does it look like? We did two studies already on the infrastructure side, and the next slide will show you uh, what we published recently in April the 23 of us, which I, by the way, would like to say is a very great example of European cooperation, uh, which maybe is an additional point uh, uh, to consider here. So we produced this map. The map that you see in front of you is actually spanning all the way from the Iberian Peninsula up to Finland, or all the way from the UK down to Greece. Um, it is a map of opportunity, because a lot of this uh, and the lines show it here, everything that is not yellow, so the dark green lines is existing infrastructure repurposed by 2040. This is not even the end of the development. And what it shows you is that because this infrastructure is there, because it today is already connected to customers and to storage facilities, it act actually provides a huge market. Now, I said earlier, the whole value chain needs to be developed. And if you start with supply, someone who wants to bring and scale up a large hydrogen production today needs customers. It needs the cash flow to finance those projects. And infrastructure can basically provide a large market and security of demand. Another aspect very important is security of supply. I said earlier, when you want to convert a steel mill or a chemical factory, uh, or when you supply for mobility, you want to make sure that you're not relying on one source only. If that source is not available, you need secure supply, which we have come to be so familiar with on power and gas. And the third one is you want competition. I mean, if you have a Europe-wide span, 
trade cross-border and basically we lend we at some point end in a commodity that is hydrogen then basically you have competition which is good for competitive prices and several sources competing for the customers this map here which we presented in april for 2040 was about 40,000 kilometers of pipelines 21 countries 70 percent of the pipelines based on repurposed uh, infrastructure so we showed it's technically possible we gave an assessment as to what are the time frames and we also dared which is a quite an exercise to to try to estimate how much is this going to cost now there's still a range which is quite wide but the important thing was for us as infrastructure providers are we actually providing something that can give you a competitive supply or would it mean if you produce hydrogen say in the future for one or two euros per kilogram do you have to add a prohibitively high add-on for the transportation and the findings were that between 11 and 22 cents per kilogram per 1000 kilometer is in the range of the production costs i just mentioned not really prohibitive it actually means that supplies for example from spain or portugal could make all the way up to central europe northwestern europe as much as north sea supplies could find their way down into europe that was a very important milestone but there's a number of questions missing and one important one is it's nice to have this network but is there enough hydrogen around and that is what today's webinar is about so we basically took some work from gas for climate which we've done before and we updated demand figures for europe what is the anticipated demand now having said that it's very difficult to assess the demand europe-wide in a top-down approach because europe is quite diverse well as for a steel mill for example it can be easy or straightforward to say well the steel mill will work the same way in germany as it may it might do in italy or spain uh, when it comes to sectors like transportation or even more so buildings it's very different because we have different geographies different climate zones we have different building stocks different legacy infrastructures on the retail or distribution side so that's why there are of course simplifications here and the the, the technology assumed or which we then rolled out all over europe certainly will not be very precise but it gives an order of magnitude and on the supply side we looked into what supplies of hydrogen are within the reach of this european hydrogen backbone so we noticed that there is a lot of discussions in many of our countries about where do supplies come from will they come from australia or chile or somewhere around the world which is all good to have these discussions but we wanted to focus and say what's within europe and you see here on the slide actually high level what we came up with so trust your attention for a moment to the map what does this map show it gives you on the left side the potential for green hydrogen uh, to be produced in the region that is marked in a certain color and on the other side it is an aggregate of the demand that we mapped out in the demand analysis and you see two things basically the first thing is if you add up the supply potential here there is more supply than there is demand projected within the reach of this backbone within europe that's we believe is quite an important uh, message if we want to keep a lot of value creation in europe that's actually something we could develop and which is within reach if we make the right decisions we also see that the supply demand balance in those regions is different and it's natural as with any other energy carrier the allocation of resources is not even so the infrastructure can also play a role here to make sure that you get the product from areas with a lot of supply to products which are dearly in need um, and uh, i think this is one of the key findings and messages uh, of today now it goes without saying that europe is not even as a european island we are connected with our infrastructure for example in the east towards ukraine and russia we are connected to the south to north africa and we are connected intensively with energy exchange happening today to norway up in the north sea now all of these regions provide large potential which will complement and might even compete with the sources that i'm that i'm describing here but for us it was very important to get a feel around this and we believe it's quite a different message if i'm just thinking infrastructure and then things have to come from far ab abroad or or things can actually be made available within what we have here um, and therefore we also did a little bit of a cost comparison pipeline versus other means of transporting hydrogen so summing up uh, 
we believe we can underpin with this study that the infrastructure has a key role to play. As I said earlier, it provides security of demand, it provides security of supply, it gives the means of a competitive European market, and it actually helps us to access those supply sources that we actually have. So now it's of course about making decisions. We found in a dialogue with stakeholders and we talked to many, many companies along the value chain, people are getting ready, people are prepared, but we need to set the right frameworks so that there is security when it comes to the investment and the right incentives in place. With that, my overview and sort of high level spoiler for later on, please stay tuned, uh, would be done. And I'm very happy and would appreciate and pass the word to Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson to hear her reflections. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, and, uh, and uh, good morning from Brussels. Um, and many thanks for inviting me to today's presentation. Well, everyone listening today knows our ambition. We both uh, need and we are determined to reach a net zero by 2050. And renewable hydrogen will hold a special place in that um, energy system of the future. But that place is not fully established yet, and uh, we are building a whole ecosystem almost from scratch. And because of that, uh, in our hydrogen strategy, we recognize that as the market scales up, production, infrastructure, and demand are expected to come online at different points across uh, time and space in, in the EU. And this is why the strategy advocates for a phased approach on the basis of no regret options. Uh, there are based opportunities here. Our goal is to produce at least 1 million tonnes of renewable hydrogen in the EU by the end of 2024. And the Fit for 55 package coming in July uh, is looking at how to enable these early opportunities in a number of ways. Well, through the introduction of hydrogen quotas and obligations for end use sectors and through certification of green hydrogen in the Renewable Energy Directive and uh, through hydrogen infrastructure development uh, in the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. This will complement the Commission the new proposal currently negotiated by Parliament and Council. Uh, but we need already now uh, lay down the framework for the next stage of hydrogen development after 2030. And uh, we are talking about larger scale production further removed from uh, existing hydrogen demand centres, uh, new forms of hydrogen demand in other um, industrial sectors and development of uh, hydrogen valleys. And I'm glad to see that the um, phased approach uh, of our hydrogen strategy is also re reflected in your study, where the hydrogen infrastructure, including cross-border pipelines, expands gradually across Europe. Speaking of uh, infrastructure, it is crucial for renewable hydrogen to scale up and uh, scale out uh, to consumers in a cost-effective way. Without it, um, our plans will only stay on paper. And we see transmission and distribution networks as a very promising way of transporting hydrogen. They will have um, to be um, complemented uh, with uh, other modes of transport. And for this reason, the Commission has uh, proposed to include dedicated cross-border hydrogen networks in the scope of the DENI regulation. And in this way, we can mobilize public funds for cross-border projects um, that are not commercially viable. Um, and the Council has endorsed this approach. Uh, last week, Member States uh, reached, uh, reached uh, agreement on general approach. And it was uh, actually very fast, just six months after the proposal was presented by the Commission. And now the Parliament uh, will adopt um, their position soon. And uh, then we aim to finalise uh, this key piece of legislation by the end of, uh, of the year, and we will have then a crucial element of our hydrogen strategy. Uh, afterwards, uh, the active involvement of DSOs and other project developers uh, will be key to develop concrete projects and turn ambition into action. And in parallel, 
we have started our public consultation on the upcoming hydrogen and gas market decarbonisation package. This package will also provide um, the Commission's proposal, proposals on how the future hydrogen grid should be regulated. And with these key regulatory developments and the EU push for production capacity and transmission development, we are confident, um, like in your report, that the uh, EU will be able to meet uh, its hydrogen demand needs. Uh, whenever needs are not met, we will be working with international counterparts to facilitate hydrogen imports from neighbouring countries. And this brings me to international dimension. And uh, um, this is an integral part of our strategy. Uh, I am often asked if the EU hydrogen strategy is only focused on enhancing EU domestic production. And my answer is a clear no. The idea is uh, for Europe um, to collaborate with our neighbourhood and in particular with Morocco and Ukraine on uh, developing projects and supporting cross-border trade. At the same time, there is a um, great scope of um, uh, of, um, for global cooperation, and we have been long-time partners, in particular with the United States and Japan. And Japan has backed very strongly for the development of hydrogen and um, has led some of the most ambitious research programs. Um, I see great potential, in particular on exchanging uh, best practices and um, developing a global rules-based market including uh, common standards, safety and uh, certification. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, your study is a welcome contribution to the debate on the European hydrogen economy. And uh, it is a useful input for the legislative proposals that we are preparing. And only through developing a shared vision and uh, goals for a European hydrogen ecosystem, we can make sure that uh, Europe leads in building hydrogen economy for a global clean energy transition. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Simpson. Uh, a clear commitment, I think, uh, to the subject. And of course, we're very keen because and, and happy that, that you say uh, this, is, this study is something that will contribute uh, and it is, of course, also to stimulate the debate, because we said that, uh, as I said earlier, there's a lot of complex questions and uh, we can contribute with the expertise that we as TSOs brings to bring to the table. And, uh, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing the developments in the next months. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, in terms of uh, the continuing of this uh, uh, study, um, there is a study, of course, and here is now the high-level reflections from the EU Commission, which we welcome very much. Um, but of course, this doesn't happen in isolation. And we said, therefore, it's very important not to be uh, just on our own, in our own little box and look at that, but actually reach out and also have the value chain uh, commit to uh, the presentations and basically give their sh and share their views uh, on what we have presented and the significance and relevance of infrastructure going forward. Um, and I would like uh, to would like you to ask them for, for the next slide, please. Handing over uh, to uh, Dan Peters from Guidehouse, who is now helping us to dig a little bit deeper uh, into the study and uh, what we've actually analyzed over time. I will come back later on uh, to introduce you just in order another incentivation to stay tuned. We do have guest speakers here as well who will give us reflections on, 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 on their view, as I said earlier, which I think is important to get a sort of complementary picture. But first of all, Dan, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. And I can already review, reveal that GIE GSE is one of the guest uh, speakers. Uh, let me focus now on uh, on uh, European hydrogen demand as we analyze it in the study. Um, this slide uh, shows the, um, the picture of, of how we see it developing uh, up to 2050. So um, our analysis shows that hydrogen will be very important to achieve climate neutrality mid-century uh, across Europe. 
meaning in this study, uh, the European Union and the UK, um, to a total um, of 2300 terawatt hours, uh, which equals roughly 220 BCM of uh, natural gas equivalent, uh, or 20 to 25 percent of, uh, of the EU and final energy consumption by 2050. Um, so this is a very large quantity of, of energy. Um, particular, um, um, we see this uh, emerging in a variety of sectors. Um, industry will be very important. So uh, hydrogen will be absolutely crucial to decarbonize industrial processes, especially in heavy industry, uh, iron, steel, ammonia, and fuel production. Also in the power sector, hydrogen will be valuable in providing dispatchable uh, electricity and providing affordable uh, storage. Transportation, mainly the heavy uh, transportation uh, uh, modes. Um, in this study, we focus on uh, heavy road transport and uh, aviation fuels. Um, and then the building, the building sector as well, um, we, we analyzed. And if you see on the right hand side of this, uh, of this slide, you see that the contributions of those sectors uh, are um, 1200 terawatt hours for, for industry, um, about 300 for, uh, for transport, uh, 650 in the power sector. The building sector will use um, uh, 600 terawatt hours of, uh, of gas, renewable and low car carbon gas by mid-century, uh, both in, uh, through district heating and through, um, um, through uh, boiler technologies. Um, this 600 terawatt hours could either be biomethane or hydrogen, uh, and this will vary from country to country. So uh, using the assumptions uh, as we did in our study, uh, it will lead to uh, 150 terawatt hours of hydrogen, but it could be anywhere up in this range, up to 600 terawatt hours. This brings me to an important uh, disclaimer or note uh, that goes for all of our study. Uh, we study the whole of Europe, the whole of the EU plus UK, based on a set of uh, uniform uh, assumptions. Now, of course, we are aware that in reality, there may be differences across countries. Uh, there may be um, different um, developments over time. We, of course, look at 2050. Uh, so just to state up front that uh, we work with a set of uniform uh, assumptions uh, and that can sometimes lead to uh, differences with what is sometimes perceived at, uh, at national level. So let's go and, and uh, take a quick deep dive into uh, the various sectors. On the next slide, we see uh, the industry sector. So industry by 2050 has set 1200 terawatt hours of, of annual hydrogen demand, mainly into the in the chemical sectors, iron and steel and fuel production. So more than half of this, uh, of this uh, quantity of hydrogen takes place in, in fuel production, um, where for example, in the aviation, we see uh, a large demand for synthetic uh, kerosene will come there in a, in a, min in a minute. Um, so the picture that you see here is actually a picture uh, that provides the, 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 that illustrates the, the view of 2030, uh, where we see roughly 300 terawatt hours uh, of, uh, of hydrogen demand across Europe. And you see here uh, how that 300 terawatt hours distributed over Europe at the NUTS2 uh, level. On the next slide, um, we uh have a little bit of background on 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 how we performed this analysis so we did a a close um, assessment of more than 300 industrial installations uh, using the eutl uh, database so uh, we get a what their um what the um yeah what the emission levels are uh, of these installations uh, all across uh, europe and then we uh, looked into okay company announcements uh, decarbonization strategies so what is the uh, the accepted view on how uh, these installations uh, will decarbonize over time based on what uh, yeah, energy carriers um, so this led to the to the view that uh, hydrogen will become very important on uh, in decarbonizing all of these uh, heavy industry sectors we also looked into um, industrial heat, and we found that mainly in medium to, to high temperature industrial heat, hydrogen will play a very important role as well. 
on the next slide, we show the transport sector as set. Our analysis focuses on heavy road transport and uh, aviation. There's also uh, a, a possible demand for hydrogen uh, in the future maritime sector. Um, we did not analyze that, but that could lead to an even, um, even higher uh, hydrogen demand overall in the transport sector. Yeah, in our analysis, uh, we conclude that um, uh, hydrogen fuel cells are expected to power uh, a bit over the half of, uh, of trucks, heavy trucks, uh, and a quarter of buses by 2050, um, which will, um, yeah, obviously also need uh, fueling infrastructure across uh, across Europe. Um, and here in this segment, uh, hydrogen plays a role alongside. Uh, electric uh, trucks and alongside the role for, for bioenergy and bio CNG. Then looking at the aviation sector, uh, here we see uh, an important role for um, both synthetic kerosene and biojet fuel. Uh, biojet fuel um, being a very attractive option yet uh, in terms of size uh, yeah, limited by, uh, by supply of sustainable biojet fuels but still a very important role there. Um, and synthetic kerosene, uh, obviously by, by 2050, will require large quantities of, of, uh, of hydrogen. The hydrogen that we, um, that we foresee uh, in, uh, in the production, uh, that's required in the production of synthetic kerosene, is accounted for in the industry sector in this study. By 2050, we expect roughly 10% of uh, airplanes to be powered by, uh, directly by hydrogen as a fuel. Then let's move to the next slide. And here um, we uh, show buildings. Um, so the building sector is obviously a, a sector uh, with a very large gas, natural gas consumption uh, today. Um, and uh, in our study, we conclude that it will remain an important uh, sector for gas today, basically. Um, from a societal value perspective, it is valuable uh, that buildings that have a gas connection today uh, keep using that gas connection in the future decarbonized energy system. Now, we considered a range of uh, heating technologies. We looked also at district heating um, and we considered the role for hydrogen and, and, and gas in general in buildings. We considered uh, an important role for building renovation in line with the EU renovation wave. Um, so very, very aggressive uh, decarbonization push. And we assumed also in our central scenario, the adoption of hybrid heating uh, system. So end of pipe energy system integration uh, with gas as a role for, uh, uh, for the shaving of, uh, of demand peaks. Now using all of these assumptions, <clears throat> basically that would lead to uh, a total uh, demand for renewable and low carbon gas of about 600 terawatt hours by 2050. And as already said um, in the beginning, um, uh, that this uh, 600 terawatt hours could be satisfied by biomethane and by hydrogen. <clears throat> and the specifics of that will depend from country to country. Using our central assumptions, there would be uh, about 150 terawatt hours of, uh, of hydrogen in the building sector. But as said before, it can be anywhere <clears throat> up to that 600 terawatt hours. And then finally, the power sector on the next slide. Uh, in the future energy system, uh, the power sector will uh, be dominated by variable uh, renewable uh, power generation, so wind, solar, but of course there's, an there's a need still for dispatchable power as well. Um, there's a remaining share of nuclear power as well, roughly uh, 6% in the total mix. Um, we see a role for uh, gas uh, to balance the system of roughly 10% uh, of the total, uh, total needs. Uh, this is of course not evenly spread out through, through Europe, uh, because obviously countries with, say, uh, a large role for hydropower um, yeah, have, uh, have less or even no need for, uh, for gas used in the power sector. So the picture that you see here on the, uh, the map of Europe that you see here uh, yeah, shows uh, how uh, in the future we foresee uh, hydrogen uh, being 
used in the power sector by 2050. So roughly on average, uh, we see a share of 7% alongside also still in addition some biomethane to be used. So uh, we see 7% point uh, of hydrogen plus still 3% of, of biomethane too, um, spread out uh, over Europe. Um, and there we see clearly some countries will require more than others. Yeah, so as I said in the beginning of my contribution, um, hydrogen will be important and crucial to decarbonize a variety of demand sectors in Europe. Um, I will stop here and uh, we'll now focus on how all of this demand will be supplied. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dan. But before that, we would like to uh, invite uh, Marco Schiffel from ThyssenKrupp, uh, one of the potential big uh, future users of hydrogen, to give uh, his view on uh, on these developments. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Case, for the introduction. So I will go a little bit more in detail uh, on the demand of uh, Europe's largest integrated uh, steel mill and uh, show how the European hydrogen backbone can uh, contribute to decarbonization of steelmaking. But let me uh, start with uh, showing what is uh, the challenge in the steel industry. So global fossil CO2 emissions in 2019 totaled about 38 gigatons, whereof 2.6 gigatons or 7% were coming from steel industry. So, but uh, the steel industry offers also the potential to fulfill the Paris Agreement because today about 95% of primary steel is produced via the coal-based blast furnace route. And steel industry has the technical possibilities to uh, change the blast furnace route to gas-based direct reduction. And for that, uh, the steel industry needs large amounts of hydrogen. So next slide, please. On this slide, we have uh, the hydrogen demand for, for ThyssenKrupp steel for our steel mill in Duisburg, uh, shown for the years up to, uh, to 2050. So we will start with uh, hydrogen injection in one commercially producing blast furnace in 2022, giving rise to the first uh, significant amounts of hydrogen used in the steel mill. Then there will be commissioning of a first direct reduction plant in Duisburg in 2024, which is uh, consecutively uh, converted to 100% hydrogen operation with a ramp up up to 2026. Then we will consume about three terawatt hours of hydrogen. A second DR plant will come into service by 2029. And in parallel to the hydrogen metallurgy, we will also ramp up our CCU project carbon to camp, which will also um, consume hydrogen to produce base chemicals from steel mill cogeneration gases. So giving rise to a hydrogen demand by 2029 of 10 terawatt hours. With the carbon to cam reaching full scale in 2030, our hydrogen demand will already reach more than 20 terawatt hours. And there is still a slight increase uh, in the years uh, up to 2040 and 2050 with a, a forecasted final demand of 28 terawatt hours of hydrogen in 2040 and 50. So next slide, please. So we think that uh, this hydrogen uh, will be delivered to, to Duisburg via the European hydrogen backbone, which will um, make the connection between the supply centers and the demand center. So I took this chart uh, out of the last European hydrogen backbone study. This is uh, the forecast for 2030. I added uh, our Duisburg uh, steel mill site so the blue point, uh, the southernmost blue point, and uh, two of our uh, hydrogen generation projects. So we have a 100 megawatt electrolysis project uh, in cooperation with RWE uh, with an initial size of 100 megawatt uh, and uh, with possibility to scale up to two gigawatt with green electricity in Lingen. So from Lingen, there is uh, an existing pipeline available already in 2022 to be converted to hydrogen. Uh, although about 30 kilometer pipeline stretch to connect uh, this pipeline to our Duisburg production site is still missing and will be constructed to 2027. So meaning that in 2027, the connection from Lingen to Duisburg is available. 
On the other hand, we have a blue hydrogen project called Edge Tomorrow Steel, which we conduct together with Equinor and OGE. This is our largest and most advanced hydrogen generation project, and which will be uh, located in Eemshaven in the Netherlands. So hydrogen can flow half of the way from the coast to Duisburg through uh, the Dutch hydrogen backbone and through a newly established, established uh, border crossing point to Germany, and then it takes the same route down as the hydrogen from Lingen. As the new border crossing point in capacity will not be sufficient to transport all these 2.7 gigawatts, a second uh, pipeline routing is necessary. And this time goes almost entirely through the Netherlands and uses the existing uh, border crossing point in 18 So meaning that in 2030, we have a second hydrogen connection from Eemshaven to Duisburg and uh, being able to deliver uh, hydrogen to our steel mill to reach our climate targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Marcus, for that interesting perspective from uh, the steel industry. It's now my pleasure uh, to present to you uh, the supply side of our analysis. So if we need uh, so much hydrogen up to over 2000 terawatt hours by 2050, uh, where will it all come from? First of all, I would like to look with you at uh, the domestic potential uh, for producing green and blue hydrogen. Uh, we found in our analysis that the potential of the EU and the UK to supply green hydrogen from dedicated renewables uh, will go up from 450 terawatt hours in 2030 to 4,000 terawatt hours by 2050. And that's taking into account the growing demand for direct electricity, land availability, environmental regulations, and installation rates. In the waterfall chart on the right-hand side, you can see how we did that analysis for 2050. So on the left-hand side, you see the electricity that can be produced in Europe uh, from wind and solar. Um, then in two steps, we add uh, the power generation from existing hydro, from the remaining nuclear power plants and from other sources. And then uh, we add uh, the uh, dispatchable power that we think will be generated from hydrogen to come to a total electricity supply potential from which we subtract in the orange bar, the final electricity demand to arrive for 2050 at 5,000 terawatt hours of renewable electricity potential available for the production of uh, green hydrogen. Uh, assuming by that time reduced conversion losses of 20%, that leads to uh, the 4,000 terawatt hours of green hydrogen potential, of which uh, a small part, the, the gray part, is of course needed to provide that hydrogen generated electricity that I showed in the third bar of this waterfall chart. This uh, overall would take about 1% of the total EU and UK land mass, and it would mean a rapid and vast expansion of the wind and solar capacity beyond what we need for direct electricity to meet those potentials. And of course, there's a, an element of public acceptance there. On the other hand, Europe can also produce large quantities of blue hydrogen. Uh, this could enable a quick start because we don't have to wait until all the electricity demand is already being served by renewables. Uh, it could drive emission reductions and accelerate the uh, pace of the transition. The supply of blue hydrogen uh, in Europe is virtually unlimited in terms of these kind of numbers because both the natural gas supply and the CO2 storage potential far exceed the hydrogen demand that we forecast. Next slide, please. On that uh, potential uh, for competitively priced green hydrogen in the EU and UK, it's of course important to look at uh, the uh, uh, cost of producing such uh, green hydrogen. Can I have the first uh, slide for 2030 there? If you see, uh, uh, if you look at this chart, it's a supply curve of the potential of the green hydrogen. I told you that it's around 450 terawatt hours in uh, 2030. We expect a demand of 340 terawatt hours by then, so that should be enough. 
but it would require, of course, a quick uh, additional ramp up of wind and solar. And here we show you the estimated, estimated production cost. A very small quantity uh, can already be produced at around uh, 1.5 euro per kilo, uh, and there's more supply at 2 euros and just above. Uh, it will uh, become by 2040 and 2050 uh, more cost competitive as both the cost of wind and solar and that of the necessary electrolysis goes down. So if we look at 2040 now, you see a much longer uh, supply curve uh, up to over 2000 terawatt hours. So uh, would be more than enough to serve the 1350 terawatt hours of demand uh, indicated by the vertical dashed line there. Um, and also you can see that the costs are going down, more of the supply dropping below that 1.5 and certainly the two euro line. And then finally 2050, there we see the full 4,000 terawatt hours of potential, uh, more than enough to meet the estimated demand by that time of 2,300 and at uh, much more attractive prices too. Uh, quite some uh, supply already at the one euro per kilo mark and up to 2,400 terawatt hours at cost up to 1.5 and another uh, 1,600 at cost up to two euros. And that means that we'll see a growing potential for uh, with the growing CO2 prices on the other uh, side, a growing potential for uh, green hydrogen that does not need subsidies. Next slide, please. If you zoom in, then you can see that the blocks in this chart uh, represent technologies. So uh, the yellow is the solar and uh, in certain countries. So the solar in Spain is here the cheapest, followed by onshore wind in Ireland, etc. And you see that uh, overall this potential is uh, spread out over Europe, but of course some regions can produce at lower cost than others. Next slide, please. On the blue hydrogen side, uh, as I said, there's also a large potential uh, because of this availability of natural gas, certainly when the direct demand for it goes down and the availability of 100 gigatons of CO2 storage potential in Europe. Uh, it can drive quick uh, emission reductions in the uh, market ramp up phase uh, when there's not yet a full uh, European hydrogen backbone. So uh, industries, for example, have to be served from uh, sources closer, closer by. Uh, we expect blue hydrogen production costs to be uh, between 1.4 and 2 euros per kilo at the CO2 price of 50 euros per ton in 2030. Um, you can see on the right hand side uh, the bars for various combinations of technology. We have retrofitted existing hydrogen production installations uh, and new ATRs, new uh, blue hydrogen production installations at various CO2 prices. Uh, the projects announced uh, to date add up to a little over 200 terawatt hours by 2030 and a little below 400 terawatt hours by 2035 and onwards, mostly in the UK and the Netherlands. Next slide, please. Then about the imports, uh, in addition to this uh, high potential for domestic EU plus UK supply, uh, the favorable economics of pipeline transport allow cost competitive imports from neighbors as well. Uh, the abundant natural resources and the proximity um, drive uh, attractive cost levels there. Major potential green hydrogen supply uh, regions outside of the EU and the UK or North Africa and Ukraine, as already mentioned by our Commissioner for Energy. This can be at a co competitive cost. Uh, for example, uh, the solar green hydrogen from North Africa could reach the backbone at cost of around one euro per kilo. Uh, blue hydrogen from natural gas producing countries is of course also an option. And in all cases, it should be ensured that such hydrogen is produced sustainably with high greenhouse gas savings. Next slide, please. That completes uh, my uh, presentation of the supply side of our analysis. 
And in this respect, uh, electrolysis are very important. So I'm very happy that the CEO of ITM Power, one of the European electrolyzer manufacturers, Dr. Graham Cooley, can give his perspective here. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, it's great to be with you um, on this webinar and uh, congratulations on the publication of the your, uh, of the Backbone Report, which I thought was very good indeed. Um, so look, um, I'm, I'm joining you today um, from Sheffield, um, from our Gigafactory. Um, so ITM powers uh, one gigawatt per annum electrolyzer factory. Um, I, just a quick introduction about ITM Power. Uh, we were the first hydrogen related company on the London stock market. Uh, we have been developing PEM electrolysis equipment now uh, for the last 20 years. And was, we were delighted uh, at the beginning of this year to move into the world's largest electrolyzer factory, which you can see behind me. Um, all of the staff are now in the factory and we are delivering products uh, from the factory. In October last year, we raised 172 million on the London stock market as she had a, a really important um, interaction with the capital markets in the city of London. And, and we were actually two and a half times oversubscribed. So we could have taken 0.4 billion uh, from the London stock market uh, to develop electrolysis equipment, but most particularly to build electrolyzer uh, manufacturing facilities. And in fact, um, but one of the important messages that I have for you today is that uh, uh, the capital markets are backing green hydrogen in a big way. They've understood the, um, uh, the need for electrolysis and its role in the energy transition. So it was, was uh, delighted to have been able to raise that money. Not only have we moved into a gigawatt scale manufacturing facility, but we raised enough money in that funding round to be able to build a second gigafactory of a larger size. And they're very much looking forward to uh, being able to announce our second gigafactory when the first one gets to uh, a significant uh, uh, utilization. So why are we scaling up so rapidly? Uh, we're scaling up rapidly because now, the electrolyzer industry needs to put in place manufacturing capacity so it can meet the incredible demand uh, for electrolysis. I think you've clicked my slides over before I've had a chance to uh, talk about it. If you could go back, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the demand for electrolysis equipment is really rapidly increasing. I've got a, just a quick historic chart for you here. Um, if you go back to 2017, we were deploying um, uh, refueling stations on shell forecourts, and we were doing that in collaboration with Linda. And those were around 100 kilowatts in size. Uh, two years later, we were deploying one megawatt unit, 2019, you, and, and that's a scale up of deployed electrolysis equipment of a factor of 10. You move forward another two years from 2019 to this year, where we've just deployed 10 megawatts at the Rhineland refinery. Um, and that's the scale up of another order of magnitude in two years. And it was delighted that Shell announced the expansion of the Rhineland refinery project to 100 megawatts in size. And we've been working with Philips 66 and Orsted on a 100 megawatt deployment in Humberside in the UK. That's another um, scale up of an order of magnitude in two years. And the target from the EU for 2024 is six gigawatts of electrolysis. And to deploy that in 2024, 2025 is another scale up of an order of magnitude in two years. So that is historically a very strong trend of scaling up by a factor of 10 every two years. That's logarithmic growth. 
And the way we're going to be able to achieve uh, that kind of growth is by making the technology modular um, and by um, having a deployment partner. Um, and we work very closely with Linda Engineering through our joint venture, ITM Linda Electrolysis. So not only can we scale manufacturing with the backing from the City of London, but also we can scale deployment and the EPC required. So uh, achieving gigawatt scale for Europe, um, a, a number of observations. I, I think it's fantastic to see Europe moving so solidly into electrolysis, um, green hydrogen, and the energy transition. And, and that's incredibly important. The industry needs incentives, and I think the package of incentives that are being designed in Europe are incredibly important. But they need to be in place quickly, and they need to be defrayed quickly. And the reason I say that is if you announce a package of policies, like the EU announced in, on July the 8th in 2020, then the industry will wait for those policies to be implemented. And they may do the opposite. They may slow the industry down on getting started because the industry is waiting for those policies to be published uh, and for those incentives to be in place. So execution Thank you, is vital uh, now. I'm, Thank you very I'm sorry, much. But we, for we have to move on quickly okay. as well. <laughs> Thank you very much Thanks for your so thoughts there. Okay. Thank you. Then it's um, um, over to Daniel uh, to introduce our special uh, guest speakers of the day. Uh, Daniel, please. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, we already seen quite some perspective here and got some sort of news and perspective also from the industry. But we're very pleased to have today with us uh, uh, Dr. Axel Wiedfeld and Francesco de la Flor. Uh, representing GIE, a very important voice in gas infrastructure in Europe. And uh, we've talked a lot about supply, but as you all know, uh, and as we know from the renewables discussion, uh, it's a question not only is there on aggregate enough energy around, but also is it there when you need it? And here comes the storage into play. And we're very happy to get some insights and perspectives as to the role and the value of underground storage in hydrogen. Axel, over to you. Um, thank you, Daniel. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, well, I'm really excited about this um, this event and also by the uh, by the description we used as you know it's a jigsaw and we have to put it all together. So let me give you um, together with Francisco um, um, a view on how storage would fit into this overall picture, and we also. We conducted a study together with Guidehouse about the value of underground gas storage, in particular to the uh, European hydrogen uh, system. Um, just a quick word on GIE uh, on the next slide, um, Gas Infrastructure Europe. <clears throat> um, it's um, the association representing the interests of European gas infrastructure operators. And infrastructure means storage, um, transmission and also LNG regasification. Um, those members work and innovate with renewable and low carbon molecules, including hydrogen, natural gas and um, biogases. And this association uh, combines the interest of uh, 68 companies from 27 uh, European Union countries. So it's it's all over and I think it's, it's complementing the uh, view we had on supply and demand, and certainly we also have to transport and um, store the hydrogen we are, we are talking about. So why did we conduct the study? We felt um, the role of um, storage for hydrogen needs to be clarified for the future. And also it requires a first estimation of um, how we could do that, of the value we could add, and uh, last but not least also, to discuss the suitability of storage sites for an um, hydrogen um, economy. So having said that, the next um, page describes the, um, the role 
we would see for um, underground storage in a, in a future economy. The ultimate objective is clearly to design and operate an energy system based on both electrons and molecules. It's not either or, it's clearly both. Um, and also to meet um, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by um, 2050, potentially earlier. So just in line with the European view of decarbonizing the entire industry. Underground gas storage uh, will be a key enabler for this objective. And um, it already provides key benefits uh, to the energy system today, and um, it will so um, in future. So we have three elements we, we normally See, element number one is the system value. Um, this enables, storage enables the efficient planning and use of infrastructure for electricity and, and hydrogen. And it adds to flexibility and um, this reduces the needs to, to overbuild, for example, um, production capacities for electricity um, and or for, uh, for gas. Value number two is the market value. With storage, um, we lower the final cost of natural gas today and in future of hydrogen, um, mainly for end users, um, because storage reduces the prices on, on short term and also on, on seasonal timescales, uh, because it just balances um, the, uh, the flows, natural gas flows, and in future, the, the hydrogen flows. And last but not least, it's, it's the insurance value. I'm sure you are you're familiar with uh, with that one and that resonates with you. Uh, storage is just a backup for extreme events such as infrastructure failure, adverse and extreme weather conditions um, as we have seen um, in the past. So um, very important that um, we look at these three um, additional values uh, we have with uh, with storage. So compared to its current use, the role of underground gas storage um, will be even more pronounced to ensure the resilience of the energy system um, as a whole. On the supply side, this is mostly due to higher hydrogen supply. Um, and on the demand side, of course, this is um, owning and managing both the, the sheer volumes as well as the demand variability of, of hydrogen. So I'm going to describe now what we are up to um, by 2030 and then beyond. So first of all, um, let's have a look at um, the uh, perspective for the next 10 years. Um, our view uh, derived from the study um, is that for the next 10 years, the hydrogen supply profile will be both variable and flat. Why am I saying that? Um, talking green hydrogen, we will certainly have a variable uh, supply of hydrogen fluctuating together and align with the renewable supply. And blue hydrogen, we have the opportunity to provide uh, flat supplies. So if we mirror that against the demand, then the demand for the next 10 years for hydrogen will mostly be, be flat, we predict, because in the first place, it would be industrial feedstock, it would be synthetic fuels for transportation we would provide hydrogen to. Um, so, therefore, this imbalance between the partly variable supply and the rather flat demand, that needs um, flexibility services, and uh, that's where uh, really storage uh, comes into play. Underground hydrogen storage uh, can provide this needed flexibility um, by storing oversupply and also by um, withdrawing at times um, of undersupply. So, this means what? What's the so what up until 2030? Um, we believe that um, in the beginning we will um, face hydrogen valleys, regional hydrogen solutions um, that will pop up in areas with um, aggregated demand and um, some storage sites will be repurposed within the next um, 10 years and possibly new ones will develop and um, this would improve the economics um, of the hydrogen valleys. Just as I explained, uh, we can balance supply and demand and by that provide services and also um, provide additional value for traders of hydrogen in future 
who make use of uh, price differentials. Um, later in this decade, the European hydrogen backbone, which we just heard, will begin to interconnect um, the first valleys and create hydrogen regions, uh, both intra-country and, and cross-border. So um, you may wonder, well, uh, isn't that the, the whole point that we interconnect? Clearly, yes. And if we look beyond 2030 on the next page and look into a scheme um, until 2050, then this interconnection will, uh, will happen. Um, so if you could provide the next slide, that would be helpful. Please, I can't see. No, that's the, that is, sorry, you have to go back. After 2030, exactly. So that's the later market stage. What are we expecting then after 2030? Um, hydrogen could expand its use to the to the power sector. You know, again, until 2030, we mainly see um, the sector industry and transportation. Afterwards, power sector with um, advancing integration of renewables and also with uh, demand peaks. And uh, that will be followed by heating sector, and that will create the additional uh, demand profile for hydrogen, uh, mainly with peak requirements. And the answer we have to give by infrastructure and by gas storage is more underground storages, more storages that will be repurposed from natural gas today to hydrogen in the future, and certainly also um, new developments of storage. And beyond 2030, we um, will face um, an environment where we treat hydrogen as a commodity, where a liquid hydrogen market will, will evolve. And that, of course, requires also interconnection on the, um, on the transmission and on the storage um, side. Um, and that will allow to use storage um, even further away from hydrogen supply and, um, and demand. So additional requirements uh, we very much feel um, comfortable with. And um, consequently, um, we think that the, the usage and integration of storage is a very uh, pivotal factor in the, in the entire scheme of the hydrogen developments. So if we now look at where um, have we got storages already today and uh, where will some of those be in the future, then um, on the next slide, Francisco will, will present um, existing work. And, and also, I think, some future deliverables we as um, GIE will, will provide. Thanks, Axel. Um, just uh, some facts and figures now in a, in a couple of slides. Not, uh, not many, but they have enough to illustrate our capacities, our storage capacities. In this uh, slide, taken directly from the report commissioned by uh, GIE and GSC, there's a lot of detailed information per country on hydrogen demand, storage needs, and storage potentials. Uh, you, you will read later on. You have the possibility to read later on. One uh, first order estimation of hydrogen storage capacity requirements for the countries covered by this initiative shows the need of, for around 70 terawatts hour of hydrogen storage uh, in 2030, growing to uh, around 45, uh, 450 um, in the 2020. And according to a GSC database in the EU, uh, EU and, and UK, there are already uh, 160 sites, half of them depleted fields, but also salt caverns and aquifers, all together provide an operational capacity of 1,160 terawatts hour. Therefore, all in all, huge amount of capacity. All undergone gas storage types will therefore have to be utilized, both for capacity and geographical uh, reasons, both repurposing and uh, development of new storage sites will be required going forward and already by 2030. This is also very important to mention that our uh, GI, our infrastructure, particularly uh, undergone gas, uh, underground storages, is the only way that such energy volumes can store. As a reference, the largest utility scale battery to date, most landing, can store some 1.2 gigawatts of energy. So we would need all uh, already over 40,000 of such batteries in 2030 to store these uh, energy volumes. Next, please. 
Next slide and last for my side. Yeah, um, uh, we uh, just uh, 31 storage uh, operators, uh, storage system operators uh, in GSC. We we provide a couple of, of products, uh, quite interesting. I would like you to consider. Uh, here um, on the right hand side, we have the uh, the GSC map. Significant amount of information is available, sites, capacities, and, uh, and more. Very complete and reliable information. I invite uh, you to visit uh, our GI web page and to download it. Also, in the future, if you want a hard copy, we can also uh, provide. GIE uh, and GSC has successfully uh, developed a storage-related transparency initiative, such, a, uh, such as the uh, storage transparency platform called Axi Plus, and will release an updated uh, uh, 2021 um, um, storage, I say, uh, map printed and interactive versions in the coming weeks. Then, please take a moment to visit it the referential source of info for uh, the underground gas storages in Europe. Thanks. Back to you, Axel. Um, yes, let's let's sum it up. Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, Francisco um, described the um, estimated storage capacity needs. Um, that is um, that is huge. Um, however, we have an existing portfolio of storage assets in in Europe and uh, we can repurpose that. Um, everyone who is familiar with energy infrastructure knows that that will take um, some years, um, arguably uh, shorter than new developments, but nevertheless, we need a certain lead time um, to provide those storage services. Good news, we have already started. So um, investigations and also repurposing of existing assets um, has already started. Um, the storage system operators uh, are active and that uh, will take a, a leading role to provide security of supply and also to offer services such as, uh, such as balancing. We believe that in general, uh, our assets are suitable for hydrogen. Salt cabins uh, are definitely suitable. Um, depleted fields and aquifers are also well equipped to store hydrogen or natural gas and, and hydrogen blends and sense uh, this is a good case. I very much appreciate that we also have the support of, um, um, of politicians and of the regulatory uh, environment, which is obviously key to develop the hydrogen market. We need a business case and we also need a clear guidance from a, a regulatory point of view and also uh, support in, in, that case, in that sense. So that needs to come together. And um, I hope that I could give you a glance into the uh, world of, of storage. Good news is we can transform the natural gas storage into um, a hydrogen storage. And with that said, um, over to you, Keith. Thanks both for this uh, important uh, guest contribution. Storages are definitely an important element in, uh, in the system of the future. And now for the final uh, section of this presentation, of the presentation of the EHP report, the European Hydrogen Backbone Analysis, we uh, move on to uh, my colleague Anthony Wang, based in London, who will present uh, the section on hydrogen transport by pipeline and by ship. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Case. Um, so yeah, sticking to the infrastructure part, we'll focus on the uh, cost comparison of uh, hydrogen uh, transport infrastructure. So uh, previous studies, in previous studies, we have concluded that hydrogen transport by pipeline is technically feasible and economically affordable. So the, the natural follow-up question is, well, then how do pipeline costs compare to other means of transport, uh, including shipping and even, even powered transmission? So what did we find? Well, um, first we found that hydrogen pipelines are the most cost-efficient option for long distance, high volume transport of hydrogen. So what you see on the, the graph on the left um, is a comparison of hydrogen transport costs in euro per kilogram for pipeline and shipping over various distances um, up to 6,000 kilometers. For shipping, we looked at three methods, liquid hydrogen in dark blue, um, ammonia in light blue, and liquid organic hydrogen carriers in yellow. And for pipelines, we analyzed 48 inch uh, and 36 inch diameter pipelines, both new and repurposed. And so our main findings, which are summarized on the right-hand side, are uh, first, uh, we found that pipeline transport outcompetes shipping uh, 
uh, as you can see on the graph, it outcompetes shipping on a cost basis for essentially all reasonable distance within Europe and also between Europe and neighboring regions. Um, the second thing we found was that hydrogen transport by ship, it really comes with a high fixed upfront cost, uh, which is related to the, the conversion and reconversion losses. So when you look at imports from uh, regions such as uh, North Africa and Saudi Arabia, uh, which have distances of up to, uh, let's say, between two and 3,000 kilometers, then you find that tr ship transport is, is three to five times more expensive than pipelines uh, per kilogram delivered. On the other side, if you if you transport from Australia or, or from afar where shipping is the only option, then of course this this would be the only option. It would cost around one euro uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. Our third uh, finding is that cost efficient um, hydrogen transport it, it really only weighs marginally on the total delivery cost. So this really gives pipeline import from neighboring regions uh, quite the advantage over importing from from other continents where pipelines are. Um, not not an option because of the sea. So uh, on the next slide, we've gone into a bit more detail on the drivers of, of the, the two different uh, types of transport. So um, the key message here is that the, the cost drivers for pipelines and ships are really very different. And this is reflected in the bar charts. So uh, for pipeline transport, you so what you see on the left, you essentially need a pipeline and a compressor and, and both a simplified level more or less scale with distance. So let's say for each additional 100 kilometer uh, of hydrogen transported, you need a certain amount of pipeline and you need a certain amount of compressor uh, and compression power uh, to cover that distance. On the other hand, uh, shipping requires a, a high uh, amount of fixed conversion and reconversion costs because you are not transporting hydrogen as a gas, which means that regardless of how much or how far you're shipping, uh, each kilogram um, essentially loses a, a substantial amount up to 20, 30% each way through the conversion process. And this could be liquefaction, gasification, cracking. Um, so that's really the key message here is that the cost drivers are very different. Um, then on the next slide, so this was a bit of a, a zoom in. On the next slide, we, we kind of step back and we look at hydrogen transport by pipeline compared to power transmission line. Um, and, and so the, the idea here is if you, so if you wanted to transport hydrogen over some distance, clearly pipelines and ships are one option. But the, the other question you might ask is if, if hydrogen is produced from renewable electricity, um, then you could also transport it as power uh, and then electrolyze it at the consumption site. Um, and so we, we looked into this and as with shipping previously, we modeled both cases. Um, the pipeline cases are the same as before. For power lines, we looked at uh, overhead a high voltage HVAC, that's in dark orange. Uh, we also looked at over at HVDC uh, in lighter orange, and then also underground um, cables in HVDC in purple. And so what did we find? Uh, so the first point is, if you just look at the, the transport costs, we found that the desired, when the desired end product is hydrogen, underground pipelines um, are two to four times more cost effective than over at power lines. Second, um, from a spatial requirement perspective, we found that 48-inch uh, underground hydrogen pipelines, so the ones in, in, in uh, uh, black, uh, can transport the same amount of energy as around seven overhead transmission lines. So that's when you compare the up to 16.9 gigawatts with the, the, the 2.8 gigawatts of, of power lines. Um, and then the third point is that, uh, you know, although these figures um, are under a certain set of assumptions. We also observed that uh, transport costs can be very sensitive to um, a range of parameters, such as the desired end use uh, carrier, the characteristics of the renewable energy source and the availability and cost of, uh, of storage. And that brings me to the uh, last point of this slide, which has been made before by several of my colleagues in this webinar, but is that we, we don't see infrastructures for electrons and molecules or for power and gas as being in some kind of uh, zero sum competitive game. Um, but instead, when, when looking at the role that infrastructure uh, needs to play in integrating large volumes of renewable energy into the system, um, we think they can, they can complement each other. Um, and so they're uh, uh, in, in no way uh, in competition. So on the final slide, uh, we've zoomed in on this comparison. I think in the interest of time, we can uh, skip the details here. Um, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with the main takeaways, which is that one, hydrogen pipelines are the most cost efficient option. Uh, two, pipeline and shipping have very different cost structures. And three, that a 48 inch pipeline can transport as much as seven overhead uh, power transmission lines. 
Um, so yeah, thank you and uh, over to you, Case. Uh, You're still on mute, Case. Thanks, Anthony, and um, your comments on the integrated use of electricity and hydrogen uh, infrastructure will be music in the ears of our next guest, Michiel Muller, uh, Program Director of the North Sea Wind Power Hub, uh, who's working with a team of international uh, TSOs on just that topic, right, Michiel? You're on mute. Exactly, uh, exactly, case, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to hear all these uh, great contributions, and congratulations with uh, the release of the report uh, um, of the team. I think it's uh, it's very good work. Uh, maybe first a brief introduction to the North Sea Wind Power Hub Consortium. Um, we are a group of, uh, of TSOs, um, in Aegina, the Danish Electricity and Gas TSO, uh, Gasuni, a, a gas TSO in, in, in the Netherlands and Germany, and Tenet, a German and Dutch uh, electricity TSO, who have joined forces a couple of years ago to uh, proactively consider what it takes to facilitate um, really massive rollout of offshore wind as anticipated. Uh, to, to be one of the key drivers in the energy transition. So current targets are around 300 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, by 2050. Um, we are now at uh, around 12 gigawatts, so you can imagine that that requires a very significant ramp up of both the deployment, but also the connection and the integration of all that power into the onshore energy system. We do this uh, very much from a societal responsibility perspective. To, to try and understand how we can do this in the most efficient way, uh, both from a cost perspective, but also from uh, societal, uh, other societal drivers, such as environment, uh, uh, environmental concerns. Um, and we believe that we uh, need to make a step change in how we connect and, and, uh, and integrate offshore wind, going away from purely radial, pure electrical connections towards um, hubs that collect the power from the offshore wind farms uh, and provide connection and interconnection between different energy markets, as well as uh, probably in the future, longer term future, also offshore power to gas uh, conversion. Um, in all of this work, and that's uh, where it uh, uh, ties in very nicely with all the work that has been presented today, uh, and you can move to the next slide, uh, we see that uh, Increasingly, uh, system integration or sector coupling or power to gas uh, type of uh, approaches are a necessity to be able to um, integrate securely and affordably large amounts of uh, power into the system. Uh, and there's there's clearly two um, two roles to play, which are not um, in competition, but are complementary and both required. So on the one hand, there is the power system itself where in the energy transition, we uh, gradually uh, reduce our ability to um, dispatch our power at our own will, but are uh, dependent on, on, on the weather patterns, basically. Uh, and hence, we have less dispatchable power in the system. And hence, we need more flexibility or other uh, carbon-free dispatchable sources. Um, so that's where uh, conversion to hydrogen and, and uh, re um, repowering uh, of that hydrogen into to power again um, comes into play, especially to provide flexibility on the longer uh, timescales. Uh, batteries and, and other uh, uh, methods do a great job on the, on, the, on the one to two day timescale, but if you go to the weeks or even longer, you require real conversion to, to other uh, carriers. Secondly, of course, there is, uh, and that's also been uh, alluded on by, by Dan, there's, there's, uh, there's, there are hard to wait, to wait sectors which, which will not um, be, be decarbonized by further electrification and require hydrogen basically as a feedstock or as a, or as a starting point of the decarbonization process. So it's really the both serving the power system in terms of the flexibility aspect as well as uh, decarbonizing the hard to wait sectors. Um, we also find that doing this in a system integrated way um, 
is really the, the, the lowest cost option. Um, and that's also the domestically produced green hydrogen. So basically with domestic renewable power uh, plays a key role in, in making that uh, into a cost effective system integration. Um, but that really means that we should um, increase the uh, integration of the two sectors, which have, of course, largely involved in parallel and separately to one another. That means that we really not need to start think about the energy system as a whole um, and integrating both operational but also planning approaches in electricity and gas simultaneously in an integral way. And I know that's the first um, steps are taken also in N2E and N2G, but uh, further steps are still required to make sure that the plans um, presented today on the, on the European hydrogen backbone also in time and in place and uh, in um, functionality uh, match with those required also from the power grid. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Case. And now you're muted. We keep taking turns there. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us and, and presenting your great initiative. And also thanks for the encouragement on the side of the uh, integrated approach, which uh, I think is all, also very much at the heart of, uh, of our analysis. So then we have um, a little less than 10 minutes for questions and answers. And I think we have a lot. So uh, Maud, who uh, should we give the floor? Uh, let's start with the question that came first uh, from uh, Manuel Vila Vicencio. Um, as shown during our supply presentation, we foresee a large potential supply from green and blue from within Europe at relatively low cost. Um, EU and UK green and blue uh, hydrogen is affordable in it's competitive with grey um, hydrogen today, but it doesn't rule out competition with other sources of um, green and blue hydrogen. Sorry, that's not... <laughs> Your question is, could you develop on the sentence domestic supply potential at affordable cost? Sorry about that. I was already reading from suggested answers there. How do you consider cost competition between hydrogen supply within and from outside Europe? And you've, you've heard a sneak preview of the answer there because we see uh, a lot of um, green and blue supply potential, but it would also require an enormous effort. We see attractive cost potential developing, but that's the same for some neighboring regions. So in the end, uh, we see a mix. And uh, if you look at imports from outside Europe, uh, we think that the imports that can be uh, reached with the pipeline uh, are uh, have a big advantage due to the uh, much lower cost than importing via ship. Uh, Number two uh, question here is what are the electricity price assumptions for the green hydrogen cost for 2030 onwards or is it all based on dedicated non-grid renewables? Uh, thanks. Um, Anthony, could you take that one? Yes, I can. So um, green hydrogen costs are based uh, entirely on uh, dedicated, so non-grid renewables as, as I was uh, asked in the question. So the electricity feedstock costs are tied to the cost of the renewable source, so be it PV or wind, um, and the capacity factor of the corresponding uh, technology in the region. And so the detailed assumptions you can find in the report. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, what other question could we still take? Our uh, a question for Daniel here. Are pipelines capable enough to transport hydrogen or would significant investment be needed to stop potential leakage? Daniel? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Um, that's uh, something that is easily answered. So um, we are and have been assessing uh, our grids, the respective TSOs and have been doing so. I can speak for OGE. So um, you have to look at, of course, the pipeline, uh, when it was built, what kind of steel was used, uh, what's the condition of the pipeline. But in overall, uh, we see that the cost of converting the, the simple sort of pipeline uh, itself 
uh, is between five and 30% of what it would cost to build a new one uh, in terms of our grid. That was sort of the range. Uh, and in principle, most pipelines are convertible. There are a few when the connection between two pipes, as has often been done in coal mining regions, where basically you have a connection that can move because the ground used to be able to move, those connection have to be, have, connections will have, would have to be replaced, which is more costly but in general, uh, you can convert pipelines, and there is actually examples of that um, within our group. I mean, um, I think Hassani is operating a converted uh, pipeline with hydrogen and has been since 2018. So that will be my short answer. Thanks a lot for that answer. Um, we can take one more question, I would say. Um, let's see if there's a, a question on the demand side that we can still handle. There any other questions, Dan? Any questions that you would like to bring up? We have one here. Why does heavy road energy use decline so dramatically to 2050? Why does the energy demand overall go down? Uh, Dan, that's for you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kay. So basically, um, we do assume uh, energy efficiency. Uh, also in uh, in road transport, so across the sectors, but also in uh, in, in heavy road transport, um, we also uh, assume that um, you know part of the um, uh, part of the segment goes to move to electric uh, battery electric vehicles, which have uh, an improved uh, energy efficiency. Um, so. Uh, battery electric and, and hydrogen fuel cell uh, vehicles, uh, we assume. Um, consume roughly 35 uh, to 60 percent of the energy as compared to conventional diesel uh, fuel. So all this together uh, means actually that indeed there is a decoupling between uh, energy consumption and uh, and distance traveled. Back to you, case. Thanks a lot. Um, with that, I think we've uh, reached the end of um, of the uh, webinar. I would like to hand it back to uh, Daniel uh, for some closing remarks. Daniel, over to you. Yes, thank you, Kees. Um, I think what we've seen today was quite a comprehensive view in terms of, first, we wanted to give an impulse with our study. Not only is it important to look at infrastructure, uh, there is an important element here, which is the storages, which was presented by GIE, uh, but also in terms of the availability of hydrogen within Europe, which we believe should be an important input in the political debate uh, to not only directly sort of consider uh, supplies, which will also come from further away regions, but let's see what we can also develop and how we can make things happen in the potential that we have here. Certainly a topic that will continue. Uh, it was great that you all took the time uh, to be here uh, in Europe or elsewhere in the world. So wishing you all a very good a day, a stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, stay tuned because I'm pretty sure uh, this topic will continue and it will not be the last time you hear of us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.